If you wanna make money in the stock market as a beginner, there's two easy steps you can follow right now. Number one, buy a low cost index fund that tracks the S&P 500. Number two, invest in this every month over the course of 30 or so years, no matter what the market's doing. $100 per month is a good, achievable place to start. This is what Warren Buffett, the greatest investor in history, recommends. But why? Because the market performance has been consistent for decades, that's unlikely to change anytime soon, meaning it'll steadily grow your money the longer you invest. This is the best investment advice you can possibly follow. But if you're confused and want to know what all this stuff means, or want to be shown exactly how to buy your very first stock, that's what I'm going to teach you today. I've been investing in the stock market since I was 19. Here's my very first stock, Aflac, now up 132%. I read every single finance book in my local library, all 28 of them and spent weeks researching that stock before I finally had the courage to make my scary at the time $300 investment. But I still use the same principles to this day, except with more money. Here's an $80,000 investment I made about two weeks ago. And here's a few other value investments. I'm gonna show you step-by-step step which stock to buy and how to buy it. I'm gonna show you how to break down which companies to actually invest in so you don't fall prey to this or let your wealth get eaten away by inflation by harnessing a powerful force called compound interest. More on that later. By the end of this video, the two steps that I outlined at the start are gonna make perfect sense. And you're gonna understand how beautiful and freeing investing really is. Learning everything in this video will quite literally change your life. That's because anyone can take advantage of the wonders of finance. But there is a dark side. Avoiding learning this stuff simply means finance takes advantage of you. You'll make less money, get worse deals, and have less comfort when you grow old. Ready to change your life? A share is a portion of ownership of a business, meaning when you buy a share, you're buying a piece of that business's growth. When the business grows, your share grows. When the business pays its shareholders, you get paid. Simple as that. So when you buy shares in Tesla, you own a small piece of the company, the production line, the Cybertruck, and even the CEO's tweets. When the company grows, your share price grows. Company shrinks, your share price shrinks. That's why you can grow your money with stocks but also lose your money with stocks. It all depends on the performance of the business you've invested into, as well as the important force that I mentioned earlier, but more on that later. Owning a share means you own the company. Coca-Cola has 4.325 billion shares. The percentage ownership of one share is equal to one divided by the total shares. Owning a share entitles you to a portion of the company's profits, which is the money the company makes after expenses are deducted from sales. You can buy stock in a company by using something called a brokerage. This is essentially a marketplace for stocks. The same way you can buy books on Amazon. You can go online, find the brokerage you want, find the stock you want, and click the buy button, which I'll show you how to do in a minute. We'll do a live step-by-step -step demo where you can watch or even buy your first stock and hit that milestone along with me. But for now, it's important you understand the fundamentals first. Just know you buy stocks as easily as buying books on Amazon. Nothing complicated. But if you want to get ahead of the game and start downloading the trading app that we'll use later, here it is. It's called Weeble, and they actually offer new customers 12 free stocks for trying them out. They'll be linked down below. When you look at a company's shares, you'll immediately notice that some are more expensive than others. For example, right now, one stock in Apple is worth $149, whereas a stock in Bed Bath & Beyond is worth only $4. Does that mean Bed Bath & Beyond is a spanking deal right now? No, not necessarily. Because in stocks, price means nothing by itself. I repeat, in stocks, price means nothing by itself. Remember, you're not comparing which set of shoes to buy. You're comparing portions of ownership in businesses. Businesses are a lot more complicated. This means more elements need to be taken into account before you can decide which price is a bargain or not. I'm gonna show you what those mean in the second half of this guide, but to return to the earlier example of Apple and Bed Bath & Beyond, the price of a company's stock at any time might be overvalued or undervalued, meaning they're either more expensive or cheaper than they should be. And if you're paying attention, a light bulb just went off in your head. The skill in investing comes down to buying stocks in a great company at a cheaper price than it's actually worth. In other words, getting a deal. If you know how to hunt down a bargain, you can learn how to invest. We're gonna go into that later, but for now, keep this skill in mind and let's keep going with the basics. How is the worth of a company determined and how does this help you pick one company over another? 
A stock's price is determined by a bunch of things, but mainly it's determined by simple economics. And by that, I mean supply and demand. The more a stock is in demand, the higher its price will go. The more people sell the stock, the lower its price will fall. Something, or rather someone, plays a huge role here, but don't worry, he's coming up. For now, there's something else to consider. Market cap. Market cap is the total value of a company, and this helps you discover whether a stock price is expensive or not. To calculate market cap, you look at the total number of shares times the current share price. For example, Apple has 15.9 billion shares. Multiply that by 149, the current share price, which gives them a market cap of roughly $2.3 trillion. So you can see that Apple is absolutely enormous and highly sought after by the market. But you might notice that one share here isn't insanely expensive. That's because there's an insane amount of shares being traded in the market. Meanwhile, one single share in another company might be worth significantly more where the total value of the company is actually worth less than Apple. And the simple reason is there are fewer shares available in that second company. Always look at market cap, which again is the share price times the total shares. Use that to determine how expensive a company actually is. Market cap is always shown on finance sites. Understanding market cap allows you to go even deeper looking at business fundamentals to see if it's worth investing in, which I'll explain later in this guide. But for now, how are things going? It's kind of fun, isn't it? I completely trust your ability to understand this entire guide. If you get what we've done so far, you can totally understand the rest. Now, from here, you might also come across things called stock splits and reverse stock splits. Stock splits increase total shares in a company and reverse stock splits decrease total shares. But guess what? In both cases, the market cap actually remains the same. It's like slicing a pie. We can slice it like this into four pieces or like this into eight. But either way, we still have the same amount of pie. It's no different for companies. So don't think that you're getting a company any cheaper if you see a stock split. That's a common mistake. Back in 1602, the Dutch East India Company was exploring and ravaging the world, but they realized they needed more money up front in order to finance their adventures. To do this, they actually sold shares in their ships. I think that's why they call it ownership? Probably not. But what this meant was you gave them money up front, and in return, you received a share of the money they brought back from their travels. This was a huge success and led to the creation of the first stock exchange in Amsterdam. Today, it's actually no different. Companies sell shares to investors to finance their activities, like creating and selling new products or expanding their operations. In return, you get a portion of ownership in the company and all the benefits that we discussed earlier. The best way to do this is actually described in the greatest investing book I've ever read, which I'll go through in a second, because we can't slow down yet. You're mastering the world of finance and ensuring that your future is a comfortable one. Let's look at the different types of stocks. Common stock is the most common. You get one vote per share as an owner, and you get a portion of the assets, profits, and ownership of the company. Preferred stock is similar to common stock, but you don't have the same voting rights, and the profit you get paid as an owner, called a dividend, is usually guaranteed and a fixed rate, unlike common stocks. Also, if a company is liquidated, meaning they sell all their assets and close down the business, preferred stockholders get paid before common stockholders. Another weird difference is companies can buy back preferred stock from you, the investor, whenever they want to. But if they do that, you'll usually get paid more than the current market rate. Now, I should say that there are far more than just two stock classes. Companies can sell any kind of stock. They can have different voting rights, dividends, prices, and anything else they can dream up. For example, the company Berkshire Hathaway has Burke A and Burke B stock, which differ both in price and voting rights. Believe it or not, the stock market is not where you buy stocks. It's simply a collection of markets and exchanges where this buying takes place. Think of it like a shopping mall with a huge amount of transactions going on within its doors. The shopping mall itself doesn't sell anything, but it's home to countless stores. In the case of the stock market, the stores would be exchanges and markets where stocks are being sold. Make sense? The three major stock exchanges within the US are the New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ, and the CBOE. 
A stock brokerage. Think of it like a store that connects you, the buyer, with someone else who is a seller. Kind of like eBay, but for ownership in companies. This is because you almost always have to buy your stock from someone else, from another investor. All brokerages do is connect you, the buyer, and them, the seller. It's that simple. And just like any store, there are different types of brokerages. Each give you a different level of service. A full service brokerage is a professional financial advisor who manages your investments, helps you out with advice, and generally supports you along the way. Companies like Fidelity are a good example of this. Discount brokerages are platforms that allow you to manage your own money. You can buy and sell shares the way you want to, and you can typically do this for a very low fee, sometimes as low as $0 for transactions. I'll have some options of those linked down below. Lastly, there are robo-advisors. These are platforms that let AIs and algorithms handle your investment management. It's like the professional advisors, except it's more automated and it's cheaper because you don't have a person doing it. A company I'm a fan of that offers this is called Betterment. They have no account minimum and low management fees. Basically, you just choose the level of investment risk that you'd like to take on and they automate the rest for you. They'll be linked in the resources of the description of this video as well. You can use any level of service you like. Later in this video, I'll be showing you step-by-step -step how to buy stocks on Webull. So if you want, you can start there. Okay, so you've wrapped your head around the basic terms and principles. You know what a stock is and you know that brokerages sell them. Now I'm gonna show you how to start making money from them. There are two ways to make money from stocks. One, earning money from dividends. And two, selling a share once its price has appreciated. Let's start with dividends. Dividends are your slice of the company's profits. So when they make money, you make money. Now, before you get too excited, this isn't normally a huge amount. These payments are made to you quarterly and around 1% to 7% of your investment annually. But even though dividends are small at first, you'll realize that purchasing a whole bunch of shares over time can add up to significant income, all of which is passive income. In other words, money that you don't have to work for. What's better than that? So as long as you hold the share and it pays dividends, you'll receive that dividend paid straight to your brokerage account. Your next method of making money from stocks is appreciation. Appreciation isn't just when you serenade your girlfriend with a boombox outside her house. It's also where the price of your investment goes up. Let's say you bought a stock for $100 and you hold it for 10 years. Luckily for you, it grew. It's now priced at $500. You made an excellent trade. That means your share has appreciated by 400%. This is how you can grow your money rather than have it eaten by inflation, which is where your money loses its purchasing power over time, meaning your money becomes worthless. Now, this is where it becomes exciting. Because if your investments return a certain amount per year, you can utilize something called compound interest to grow your money exponentially. As Albert Einstein supposedly said, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it, earns it. He who doesn't, pays it. Compound interest is earning money on the money you've earned. Like a snowball, starting small, rolling downhill, picking up more snow. For every little bit of extra snow that it picks up, it becomes that much larger on the next revolution. That's compound interest. So let's say you invest $100 in a share that has a 5% return. This means by the end of year one, your $100 would have earned $5 in interest, making your total $105. This means next year, without adding any additional money, you you make $5.25 in interest, ending year two with a total of $110.25. And this just keeps going and going, adding up to massive amounts of money, compounding on one another until finally you're like this guy. Take a look at this interest calculator. $10,000 invested at a 7% return makes you just $700 in interest year one. But without adding any additional money, that same money, thanks to compound interest, earns you around $6,000 year 30. All in after 30 years, that $10,000 with no additional investment turned into $81,165. So dividends, appreciation, and compound interest, that's how you make money with stocks. Time to start buying shares, right? Hold on. Just as your shares can gain money, they can also lose money. It happens easily if you're not careful. You want to make sure you're picking the right types of stocks. All stocks are subject to volatility. This means their price can fluctuate up and down. When it goes up, your money grows. When it goes down, your money shrinks. It's no surprise that if you're looking to make money from the stock market, you want to avoid stocks that are too volatile. With that in mind, these are the different types of stocks. 
Income stocks, those are low volatility with steady dividend payments. These are the safest kinds of stocks. Blue chip stocks, these are stocks with a long proven reputation of positive profits and consistent dividends. They're the opposite of volatile stocks. Penny stocks, those are cheap stocks that trade for less than $5. They're small companies and come with a lot of risk. Speculative stocks and meme stocks are super risky and typically based on businesses trying out a new technology, trying to break into new markets, or businesses where investors are hoping the price will skyrocket, kind of like GameStop. A new investor generally wants to avoid this as you're pretty much gambling. Growth stocks, those are companies that are looking to expand in size. They reinvest all profit they make back into themselves to help fuel growth. This means you probably won't make a dividend investing into these types of companies, but they can be great picks for price appreciation. Cyclical stocks, these are companies that get thrown around by the economy. When the economy goes down, these stocks plummet with them. Airlines are a classic example because when times are bad, we don't really want to shell out on vacations. Defense stocks, they're the opposite of cyclical stocks, and they remain largely unaffected when the economy is throwing a tantrum. Healthcare is an example of this because whether things are up or down, we all need healthcare. But here's where things get exciting because now we get into value stocks. These are the stocks loved by the investing goat himself, Warren Buffett, and his mentor, Benjamin Graham. But why? Value stocks, those are companies that are undervalued by the market, which means you're getting a business at a cheaper price than you should. It's bargain shopping. Benjamin Graham's approach was simple. He'd buy a business on its last legs, one that was cheaper than it should be, and then he'd sell it for a profit. But Warren Buffett took this idea of value one step further. His approach is to find great companies that are undervalued by the market, or even at an okay price in the market, and then invest heavily into them. Unlike Graham, He's not out to find a deal above everything else. He just wants to buy great businesses at a good enough price and then hold them forever, reaping the profits and passive income over time. But both investors had something in common and it's explained in one book. The Intelligent Investor was written by Benjamin Graham and widely considered the Michael Jordan of investing books. Warren Buffett himself says it's quote, by far the best book on investing ever written. There are countless reasons why, but one stands out among all else, Mr. Market. Yeah, that guy. It's time you find out who he is. Imagine there's a guy who shows up at your door every day. Now, before I tell you what he's up to, let me set the stage. This guy is moody completely blows things out of proportion. The day's events dramatically change how he feels. Something good happens and he's over the top optimistic. Something bad happens like a negative news story and he acts like the world is ending and will never recover. Now, why does this matter? Well, this unstable fella has something to sell you shares in publicly traded companies, and he really wants you to buy. Sometimes he quotes you a reasonable price. Other times he quotes you an insane price, and it's totally dependent on the day. Now here's the thing, whether the price he offers you is cheap, expensive, or just right, you don't have to buy. You don't have to do anything actually. You just have to hear the prices. Then he just leaves and comes back the next day, where he gives you a new price, depending on that day's events. This unpredictable guy is Mr. Market. He's Benjamin Graham's way of explaining the irrational way the market behaves. And here's the point that he's trying to get across to you. Every day, the market's gonna offer you all manner of prices, high, low, and reasonable. And it'll be driven by irrationality and the group think of investors. Investors following the latest hype train, positive or negative. Your job is to not buy into any of that, divorce yourself from it, and simply profit when Mr. Market offers you a fantastic price. Instead of being part of the irrationality, you make money from the irrationality. But what's the best way to do this? One of the greatest ways to protect yourself from the irrational ups and downs of the market, as well as from your own ignorance when dealing with the market, is to diversify. Ignorance. You might not like the way that that sounds, but let's be honest here. You're not always going to pick the right stock. Mistakes happen. So you need to ensure that you don't bet all your money on one company. Otherwise, you're overexposing yourself to risk. So what do you do? You diversify, which means investing in different companies, in different sectors and industries, and even different geographies if you want. Diversification means if one investment goes down, 
you're fine. You have other stocks that didn't go down. Now, is there an easy way to diversify your portfolio of investments if you're a beginner? Yes, it's called ETFs and index funds. An ETF is an exchange traded fund, which is just a really boring way of saying you get a package deal on a whole different bunch of shares. For example, instead of paying $100 for a share in one company, you could pay $100 for a tiny portion of dozens or even hundreds of companies. The most popular ETF is the SPY, which gives its owners a small piece of the largest 500 companies in the US. Think about that for a second. Think about how many different companies, industries, sectors, and parts of the country that covers. You're basically buying a portion of the entire country's economy, which means your investment is fairly safe. Airlines go down? No worries. You've got healthcare companies in there. Oil's booming? Sweet. That's in there too. You get it all. By using an ETF like this, you're automatically diversifying your portfolio. But there's also a very similar version of this called index funds. An index fund is a type of ETF that matches or tracks an entire financial market. There are index funds for all sorts of things, large companies, growth companies, tech companies, or even agriculture, under the ticker symbol MOO. Seriously. By the way, ticker symbol is the code that you type in to find a stock or a fund on a brokerage when you're looking to buy that thing. Now, if you'll remember, an index fund was the type of fund that I recommended you buy at the start of this video. That's because it tracks the market. You're automatically diversified. And if you go with the American market, like the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ, you've got a long proven track record of success. Index funds are so reliable that Warren Buffett placed a million dollar bet that Vanguard's S&P 500 index would beat a professional investing hedge fund over a 10 year period. And guess what? He won. The hedge fund he competed against with all their resources and money behind their investments accepted defeat. This is how insanely powerful index funds are and how easy they make investing. See why I said you should invest in one? Just do it! Now, you can take the advantages of index funds a step further by using something called dollar cost averaging. Dollar cost averaging is where you invest the same amount every month into an investment. You do this regardless of price fluctuations of that investment. If the price tanks, you buy. If it skyrockets, you buy. That's the whole point. You do that every single month the exact same amount. Here's a dramatic example. Let's say your goal is to invest $100 every month on shares of the same index fund. Month one, it costs $10 per share, so you get 10 shares. Month two, it goes up to $50 per share so you get two shares with your $100. Month three, it's down to $5 per share, meaning you get 20 shares that month. The point is, no matter what the market is doing or what the news is saying, you keep investing the exact same amount. All this does is completely take the emotion out of investing, allowing you to average out the scary lows and the exciting highs of investing. Using the dollar cost average strategy also means you're in the market for a longer time, which is great because the longer you're in the market, the better given its past performance. The only time dollar cost averaging might not make sense is if you have a huge lump sum of cash sitting idle, like let's say a million dollars. It's better to invest that all at once instead of spreading it over many months. This again is because it's generally a good idea to have that money in the market for as long as humanly possible. But for the rest of us who have a normal amount of money to invest each month, spreading it out is about as good as it gets. Combining index funds and dollar cost averaging has been recommended by Warren Buffett, billionaire John Bogle, and just about every rich guy with a stable pile of cash. Mutual funds are professionally managed financial vehicles that pool investors' money and try to beat the market by purchasing a variety of stocks, bonds, and other assets. They're diversified in the sense that they invest in many different companies and sectors, but their performance is based on the manager's skill and their luck. And the reality is that nearly 90% of actively managed funds don't beat the market. So you're almost better off with an index fund or an ETF. Now, some of these funds, they'll try to sell you the dream of making incredible returns the easy way, but don't believe the hype. And remember that Warren Buffett wager, the safest strategy is to simply bet on the market, not bet on beating the market. But what about that other thing that people like to put money in? Property. Is there something you can do about that? Why oh, yes, I'm glad you asked. They're called REITs. 
REITs are how you can invest in real estate without actually owning real estate. Essentially, you're investing in companies that own, finance, or operate income-producing real estate. So you get a slice of that pie without actually having to manage or find real estate yourself. Each REIT focuses on different types of real estate, from commercial properties to family homes. Take a look around and see which one you want to get involved with. The benefit here is that REITs give you access to a totally different kind of asset. Instead of being solely tied to the performance of the stock market, which can be quite dramatic at times, you're now involved with the real estate market, which helps balance out your exposure to risk, which is a really big deal. The basic risk that comes with all investments is that you can lose money. Whenever you invest, you're exposing your money to the chance that it just might decrease. And there are three key types of risk that you want to look out for. Market risk is where the market tanks and takes your investment down with it. Specific risk is where the individual company you're invested in has issues like debt or profitability, and those issues threaten the company's health and your wallet. Interest rate risk is where increased interest rates send stock prices falling. Because when interest rates go up, it means it's more expensive for companies to borrow money and expand their operations. Now, all three of these types of risk are important to watch out for, but how you navigate them will come down to just one thing, your risk tolerance. This essentially comes down to knowing yourself and your emotions. How much money are you willing to lose? How much are you willing to risk? Because investing is always going to expose you to this fear, especially if you're investing in the stock market over a long period of time. Now, using a strategy like dollar cost averaging, based on all evidence and all advice available, you'll almost certainly be fine no matter what. But there will be times when you don't feel fine. If you invest long enough, you will see articles telling you that this is the worst time ever to invest. Are you going to panic and cash out when that happens? It's important to ask yourself that. Only you know the real answer. Now, there are ways to make this easier on you. You could pick higher risk investments like options, crypto, speculative stocks, futures, and collectibles, all of whom are extremely exciting and have the potential to make enormous returns if you're lucky. But if you're unlucky, you'll make enormous losses. You could pick medium risk investments like real estate, mutual funds, large and medium sized stocks, ETFs, REITs, or high income bonds. These are the middle of the road. A good balance, they'll go up, they'll go down. Some like the S&P 500 are safer than others, like single companies. Or you can go with the lowest risk investments. These include government bonds, bank accounts, inflation protected securities, cash, CDs, notes, and bills. They're super safe, but you're not gonna make any huge returns here. In fact, you won't even make good returns. For example, the S&P returns about 10% over time, whereas bonds return just five to 6%. However, with bonds, you're essentially guaranteed a return and an extremely low likelihood of loss. Whichever level of risk you're comfortable with is completely up to you. But one thing isn't. You need a solid investment plan and you need to stick to it. Now, a plan can be extremely simple. Something like I will invest $100 a month into ETFs. That's great for starters. But again, it's important to stick to that plan, to actually do it. And you do this with the knowledge that it's totally okay to later change plans. If your plan is to invest $100 a month now, it's okay to change that plan to $500 a month later but then stick to that plan. Now back to risk. Many investors will base their portfolio in those middle of the road risk investments, while later sprinkling on some of the super risky stuff and some of the super safe stuff on top. One thing that's worth addressing here though is the idea that you can beat risk by timing the market. That is buying or selling stocks at the perfect time before the price goes up or down, leading you to make a killing. Unfortunately, this isn't really possible, not over long time horizons anyways. If it was possible, why wouldn't mutual funds with millions or even billions of dollars worth of resources be able to do it consistently? Because it's almost impossible. Again, return to the idea of dollar cost averaging. This is the opposite of timing the market. And thankfully, it's way less work. Us humans, we tend to think that more work always equals more results. In investing, that simply isn't always the case. With dollar cost averaging, you don't have to know what's gonna happen in the market. You can even forget about the fluctuations of your own emotions. You just invest regularly into a logically sound, moderate to low risk investment over a long period of time. I wasn't lying when I gave you that advice right at the start of this video. I gave you the answer right from the get go.
Buy a low-cost index fund that tracks the S&P 500. Invest in this every month over the course of 30 or so years, no matter what the market's doing. $100 per month is a good, achievable place to start. Now you know why it works. Now returning again to risk management, unlike trying to time the market, there is an art to risk management, and that art is how you balance your portfolio. Now there's not one single perfect portfolio. Each one should be a reflection of your personal finances and the level of risk that you're willing to take on. Are you extremely risk adverse? Well, hold mostly bonds and maybe a few stocks and ETFs. Are you okay with moderate risk? Then hold a few bonds and mostly ETFs or index funds. Are you a total madman? Then go all in on speculative investments, meme stocks, penny stocks, and out of the money call options. Don't do that. To illustrate this, I'm gonna take you through a few portfolio examples. Take a look at this Warren Buffett style portfolio. Super simple, 90% S&P 500 ETFs, 10% government bonds. Now, famous investor John Bogle, he advised adjusting the amount of bonds in your portfolio by choosing a percentage corresponding to your age. So if you're 30, then 30% bonds, 40, 40%, and so on. For a more complex example, let's look at this stock allocation investor Paul Merriman likes. He breaks it down like this. That's actually a really cool portfolio idea. The logic here is that this portfolio diversifies you across the US market and the international markets, ideally giving you a couple percentage points above just investing in the S&P 500. However, Warren Buffett would argue that simply investing in the S&P 500 is diversification enough. Listen to whoever you want. And while you're thinking about it, consider hitting that subscribe button down below. I work really hard on this content and it would mean the world to me. But in general, you can build a portfolio any way you want. However, if you wanna build a portfolio out of specific stocks, you're gonna need to be able to pick them. And if you wanna do that, you need to be able to analyze a stock. Now this section is entirely optional. If you take the recommended advice of dollar cost averaging into index funds every month, you'll never have to analyze a stock, ever. But it's still extremely helpful to understand why a company is valuable and how to measure value. Analyzing a stock is about breaking down the inner workings of a company to see if it's worth investing in. That's it. As soon as you know you've found a company worth investing in, you simply wait for Mr. Market to give you a good price and you start buying. It's really that easy. To analyze a company, you want to take into account a variety of factors. The company's history, their CEO, their sales, rate of growth, profitability, industry, their X factor, as in do they have something intangible that people respond to like Disney or Coca-Cola that gives them a competitive advantage? and much, much more. The factors are actually unlimited, which means that part's not so easy. You need to understand in depth what this company has been doing, is doing, and will be doing in the future. You need to understand the company like it's your own business. The best place to start this process is with the three financial statements. The three financial statements are the income statement, the balance sheet, and the cash flow statement. These give you a financial picture of what the company's actually up to. The first is the income statement, otherwise known as the profit and loss. This shows the overall performance of a company in a quarterly or annual period. Let's look at Apple's income statement on Yahoo Finance. Up top, we can see the total sales or revenue over different time periods. Then we have gross profit. That is revenue minus costs of goods sold, which are input costs like supplies and materials. If we take gross profit and subtract operating expenses, which include things like rent, equipment, and payroll, then we get operating income. You can think of operating income as the actual profitability of the company before taxes and other financial activity like investments or interest. Make sense? It's actually a lot simpler than it appears. It's made to make sense. The second is the cash flow statement. This helps a company track the cash going in and out, basically what they've spent, what they've earned, and where it's all gone. It's like a piece of paper that says, you shouldn't have blown all that money last night. Let's take a look at how it works. You can see the cash that Apple has generated from operating activities. This is super important. This shows you Apple can produce cash purely from its business operations. Not that it's profitable, that's a different thing. It simply shows you that Apple can generate lots of that sweet, sweet green paper we all love so much. It's no wonder that Warren Buffett considers this the most important line in any financial statement. Next, check out cash used in generated by investing activities. This shows you whether Apple is spending money on investing and how big that number is compared to the cash it's bringing in from operating activities. Based on this data, we can see that Apple has invested money, but it doesn't even dent their operating cash generation. You wanna make sure the cash 
outflow from investing does not zero out against the cash inflow from operations that you looked at before. But why? Because it means the company is spending as much money as it brings in, which makes it a big fat net zero. Make sense? Next, you've got cash flow from financing activities. If this number is positive, it means the company had to do things like issue stock or take out loans in order to fund its operations. If it's negative, it means the company is doing things like buying back stock, issuing dividends, or paying back its loans. In most cases, you want this number to be negative. This indicates that the company has strong cash flow and is in a position where it's competent enough to pay back what it owes, you know, like you once you start managing your finances like a boss. Which reminds me, just as important as investing is managing your own incomes and expenses, which means tracking those things rigorously. Now there's tons of apps that can do this, but a free one that I personally use is called Personal Capital. I'll have them linked in the description as well. Now I know that these sheets can be overwhelming, but just stick with me. I completely believe you can whiz through these with just a little bit of practice. And that brings us to the final sheet, the balance sheet. This shows you the financial position of the company at the time of filing, how many assets it has, and how many liabilities, like debts. This is what it looks like for Apple. We're going to click Expand All to take a look at everything. We can see their total assets of $352 billion. The reason I say billion is because all of these numbers are in thousands, as we can see up top. This sheet also shows us Apple's cash, which comes out to an insane $18 billion on hand. Scrolling down to liabilities, I'd like to point out current liabilities. These are debts that are due within the next year. It's very important that the company has incomes to cover this debt. Now, if you want to go even more in depth on these sheets, I highly recommend this book, Financial Statements, a step-by-step -step guide. It's linked in the description below. Grab it, read it, and you'll be armed with incredible knowledge for investing and stock picking. But look, financial statements aren't the only tool you can use to evaluate a company. You can also use financial ratios. Financial ratios allow you to look at widely used ratios to compare one company to its competitors and industry standards. This gives you a solid picture of how a company is actually doing. The first is the P to E ratio. This shows you how much you need to invest in order to receive $1 in earnings. So if the P to E is 15, you need to spend $15 to earn $1 in one year. The second is the current ratio. This shows you a company's ability to pay off any debts it has due within a year. Remember those current liabilities? For example, airlines tend tend to have tons of liabilities. And generally speaking, you want to invest in a healthy company that can pay its debts. Every industry has different average ratios though that you want to look out for. However, a ratio of less than one for the current ratio is usually a bad sign. Third is the P to B ratio, price to book. This tells you how the market values the company, the price, compared to how the company values itself, the book value of its assets. It's not always the same because, you know, Mr. Market doing his thing. Fourth is the D to E ratio, the debt to equity. This tells us the level at which the company is taking on debt relative to its assets. Now, taking on a lot of debt might not always be the worst thing. For example, the company could be using that debt to finance explosive growth. That said, if your prospective investment is taking on massive debt, you definitely want to know the full picture. Fifth is ROE, return on equity. This tells you how good the guys running the company are at using their equity to make profit. Obviously, you want this as high as possible, as it means you have some good brains running the business. And even better if this ratio is at least equal or exceeds the business's competitors. It's always great to compare these to the business's competitors. Finally, we have the ROA, return on assets. This tells you how good the company is at using its assets to make profits. Like ROE, you want to compare this to competitors so you know how effective the business is within its industry. Now, there are a bunch of other ratios you can use, but the six that we covered here are the most important ones. And an extremely useful site for this is called Finviz. It's completely free. If we search a company up top and then scroll down, we can see all the financial ratios provided for us. P to E, current ratio, P to B. This will even show you other info like their next earnings date and the percent difference dividend yield. It's extremely useful. This site also is useful for finding stocks to later analyze. If you click the screener up top, you can actually filter by ratios. And then that way you can target only companies that you'd already want to invest in because they fit within these ratios. I actually have an entire 
stock filtering spreadsheet that will be linked below that I built specifically to find value stocks using Finviz. This shows you exactly what to look for and why. You'll find that alongside a complete tutorial walkthrough of that spreadsheet. So now that you know the basics of breaking down stocks and seeing if it's worth investing, the next step is making your first investment, which we're gonna do together. There are a few different ways you can go about buying stocks. These are your order types. The most common is a market order. This is where you order to buy or sell a stock at the current price. The second is a limit order. This is a buy or sell order that will execute if the price reaches a specific number. So with this in mind, let's buy some stocks and ETFs using market orders and limit orders. I'm doing this on Weeble, which I've linked in the notes below. You can download that to follow along. I'll also link below an excellent trading app to use if you happen to live in Europe. Now for the tutorial, simply click that Weeble link in the description, notice the free stocks you'll get, fill in your information, create your account, and connect a bank account to go ahead and fund the apps so you can buy stocks. Okay, to buy a stock, click the Markets tab, then the Search icon. Let's invest in an ETF first. I'm gonna type in the ticker symbol SPY, SPY, for the S&P 500 ETF Trust. Click that top one, click Trade on the bottom, here we can see the current price, order types, whether we're buying or selling, and how many shares we wanna buy. Let's start with a market order. We'll click order type, now the amount to invest. Right now this is in shares, which means the minimum investment is actually $394. But what if we don't wanna invest that much? It's actually not a problem. Just click that blue share button and it turns into dollars. Here you can buy a fractional share at any dollar amount you like. Let's do $100. Now we simply click buy and confirm. Congratulations, your very first investment. Now let me real quick show you a limit order. Back to the markets tab, search. This time let's do Warren Buffett's company, Berkshire Hathaway, ticker BRKB. Click trade. And this time we're gonna do a limit order. The easiest way to think of a limit order is to remember, I only want to purchase if. So let's say I only wanna purchase a share if price drops below $300. Then I type 300 for the limit price. Enter the quantity, then the time in force. This matters for limit orders. If we're okay with it canceling at the end of the day, we can leave it as is. If we want the order to stay active, we need to change it to good till canceled. When it looks good, we click buy and confirm. It's that simple. If you can do those steps, you can buy whatever stocks or funds you possibly can dream of. Take that, apply the techniques and the knowledge outlined above, and you'll be well on your way to crushing your investing journey. This is, it's amazing. From here, if you'd like to support the channel, get even more content from me, and have access to an entire massive community of investors learning and helping each other become the best versions of ourselves, check out Finova linked down below. I really hope to see you there. Just make sure whatever you do, when you start racking up the profits in your investing journey, don't forget to pay your taxes and subscribe.